you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. Come on, hallelujah. And hallelujah. You've won it all. You have won it all for Death couldn't. Death could not hold. Seated in majesty. Thank you, Jesus, for being in this place today. Thank you, Lord God, for being among us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that your throne is in this place. You are the king over all of our circumstances. We don't take this for granted, God, that we get to come before you. Thank you for your mercy and your patience with us, Lord. Before you're seated today, I want you to take at least a minute Find somebody you've never met before, never met before, and make sure you introduce yourself before you go be seated. Go take a minute, go ahead, and then you can be seated. Go find somebody you've never met before. It's got to be somebody you don't know. Don't cheat. Don't cheat. It's got to be somebody you don't know. You might have to go all the way to the back. You might have to walk around a little bit. If I could get more in the monitor. If I get more in the house, that'd be great, Jose. Thank you, buddy. All right. Y'all didn't cheat. Praise God. Finding somebody you actually don't know. I know it's hard. It should be hard. It should be hard to find somebody you don't know in a healthy church. You hear what I said? It should be hard to find somebody you don't know in a healthy church. Don't come to church and just sit down by yourself and never say hi to anybody or talk to anybody. I got to get in there quick. I got to get out quick. Man, it ain't church. It's a family. Know what's going on. Bring an enchilada or two next time. Bring a little taco with some meat sauce. Bring a little flauta. Bring some carne asada. Come on, man. Bring a candy cane for heaven's sake. I mean, my God. Bring a pumpkin. My Lord. We are in the spiritual warfare series, but I want to make something clear. When the series is over, you're still in a spiritual warfare life. This is a life. I'm going to read a little bit of scripture and then we're going to get into the word today. But you have to be in the right position before you get the word. The Bible says that the word of God was preached but it didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. So I'm just challenging everybody from the front to the back. This could be Sunday, the whatever the date is, the 13th. We came to church. We went home. Or it could be a changing, shifting thing, season, season shift, family shift for you. Depending on how you receive the word depends on what happens for you outside of this building. So I'm just encouraging everybody, let's get our faith in. Let's lean in on our seats. Let's make sure you got notes to write with because let me ask you a question. Why would God continue to talk to you when you don't even write down what he says because you're telling him you don't care what he says? Let's get our pens out, let's get our phones out, iPads, whatever tech you got. <laughs> Exodus chapter 14, 10 through 16. I'm going to read two scriptures, then we're going to minister. As Pharaoh approached, this is Exodus chapter 14, 10 through 16, the Israelites looked up and saw the Egyptians marching after them. They were very frightened. So the Israelites cried out to the Lord. 
Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? <laughs> what is this that you have done to us to bring us out of Egypt? Did we not say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, leave us to serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians as slaves than to die in this wilderness. It's the way I read it at least. <laughs> then Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Take your stand. Be firm and confident and undismayed and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For those Egyptians who you have seen today, you will never see again. <laughs> those rulers that have been over your life for somebody in this place, you're never going to see that thing again. Somebody. Oh, I love this part. The Lord will fight for you. But what do I got to do? What do, I, what, what do I need to do? Just wait. Here it is. While all you need to do is this. Keep silent and remain calm. Turn to your neighbor and say, just stay calm. Come on, turn to your other neighbors. Stay calm. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell those boys over there to get moving. Tell them to get their wives and children. Tell them to move toward the sea. As for you, Moses, do what you're supposed to do. Lift up your staff stretch out your arm over your head and divide that water so the sons of israel may go through in the middle on dry land one more scripture first timothy 6 12. first timothy 6 12. i want to hear the crinkling of pages i don't hear anybody flipping that's what i'm talking about fight the good fight of faith. Let me read it again. Fight the good fight of what? Faith. Okay, one more time. Fight the good fight of what? Faith. In the conflict with evil. Take hold. Somebody say it. Take hold. Say it. Take hold. Say it. Take hold. Okay. Of the eternal life to which you were called. And for which you were made the good confession of faith in the presence of many witnesses. All right. Ephesians 6, as we read it, it talks about armor. Paul tries to talk to us and say, you're in a battle. You have an enemy. If you don't know who he is, his name's the devil. If you don't, don't know who he is. He's an enemy. The Bible says that he comes to only do three things in your life. You ready? Who knows what they are? Oh, man, we got people maybe looked at a scripture or two. How about this side? What's the devil come to do in your life? Okay, now does it say that he has any other agenda for you? Do you read that anywhere else? I don't, I don't read it anywhere else. He comes to steal from you. He comes to kill you if he can. And then he wants to destroy you and everyone you love. We all clear on this? He's not going to repent. He's not going to apologize to you. There's not going to be a day he's able to repent to God and God forgives him. It's not going to happen. He is forever your enemy. And he hates you. He hates your wife. He hates your boy. He hates your daughter. He hates your grandchildren. He hates your success. He hates it when you smile. He hates it when you sing. He hates it when you have anything going at all in your life. The only thing that he thrives on is your failure. Let's just be reminded from the front to the back. You hear me? He hates you back there. He hates you in the front row. It's never going to change. He is going to be your enemy. Stop trying to talk with him. 
Stop trying to bargain with him. He's never going to change his mind. Don't fall for the tricks anymore. He's an enemy for life. And there is a battle that's going on. There's a war that's happening. And the war is this. The title of this message is the war for faith. There is a battle going on for your faith. What do you mean? Like the devil wants my faith? Yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but faith works all the time. But it works for the negative and the positive. Faith in the negative is what we call fear. Fear is faith in Satan's promises. When you receive the spirit of fear, the Bible says something very specific. God never gave you the spirit of fear. Okay? It didn't come from the Lord. Now, when we take something that doesn't belong to us, we call that stealing. So there are consequences for being a thief. When you take from the devil what belongs to him called fear, you are stealing from the devil something that never belonged to you. So you are reaping the consequences of a thief. What are they? Anxiety attacks, restless nights, nightmares in your sleep. Because you are a thief, you have stolen from the enemy something called fear god did not give us a spirit of fear but he did give us the spirit of power and love and a sound mind now let me just say it again god did not give us a spirit of fear but he gave us three spirits the power of the power of and a sound mind that's what he gave you so what are you doing with fear It's not for you. It doesn't belong to you. You have no right to have it. It's not in the things that Jesus paid for. He has a whole chest. He's got a whole vault full of amazing blessings he paid for. But one of them is not called fear. You see, there is a fight for your faith. The enemy wants your faith, and why does he? Because when Jesus died on the cross, there's a really powerful thing you got to realize. It said he came back and he talked to his disciples before he went to heaven, and he said, all authority has been given to me. How much authority? How much over there? All authority has been given to me. So if he has all of it, how much was the devil left with? Oh my God. Okay, okay, wait a second. So he says, all authority has been given to me. Then he tells you and I the Great Commission. He says, now go, therefore. Now, when he looked at those disciples and he said, go, he transferred authority. So for you and I today, we still have the Great Commission. Jesus had to get the authority that we lost through Adam. One man lost it. Romans 5 says, because a man lost it, a man had to come and get it back. There was a man named Adam who lost it, but the second man, Adam, named Jesus, came and got it back. All that authority that was given to us in Genesis 1.26, where God tells Adam and Eve, you have dominion now over the earth. You have dominion over the fish of the sea. You got dominion over the birds of the air. You got dominion over all the things that happen. In other words, I, Jesus, am a king, but I make you a king. So that's why I'm the king of kings. I'm a king, but I make you kings. So I'm a king. I want a bunch of kings. That's what Jesus says. And kings rule. He says, I'm ruling up here in heaven, but I'm going to give you this place called earth for you to rule. So he says, you have dominion. And then he says this, it's powerful. Genesis 1, 26 through 28, read it again. He says, I have dominion. I've given you dominion. But then he says, fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply. God wants you to have success. Success is not 
a prosperity only word. It's not a word from the world. God made up the world success. Joshua 1 8, meditate in this book of the law day and night, and then you will be successful in all that you do. It's a God word. He wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to have fruitful children. He wants you to have a fruitful life. He wants you to have fruitful businesses. He wants you to have a fruitful marriage. He doesn't want you to survive your marriage. He doesn't want you to live a prison sentence with your husband and wife. He wants you to enjoy your life. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and don't miss this and subdue it. What does it mean to subdue? The word subdue means this, good words, which you, which you guys said, amen. Subdue means this, there is an enemy that is there, but you have to take him over and restrain him. Now, wait a minute, you're thinking this is Genesis 126, what's going on? Do you know that the devil was already in the garden? What? Well, Daniel says that the devil had already been cast out of heaven. It says, I saw the devil fall like lightning, Jesus repeats in the book of Matthew, and he hit the earth. So he's already on the earth. So when God tells him, fill the earth and subdue it, he knows there's a little snake already wandering around. He said, you're going to have confrontation with him. You're going to see him, but you have the power to overcome him. It says later on about Cain and Abel, when Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, that Cain comes and he's getting all upset and the God looks at him, he says, why are you so downtrodden? What's wrong with your face? Cain was already thinking about killing his brother and God the Father is such a father, he even notices what's going on even in the face of his son. You see, God's a father and he looks at his children and he sees everything you feel. He sees what's going on, he knows what's happening in your mind. So he goes over to Cain and he says, listen, 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 listen. You could still do the right thing. But he says, if you don't, be careful because sin is crouching at the door and it wants to take a hold of you. But you must subdue it. Overcome this thing. You got the power. This dominion and authority has been given to you. However, Adam lost it. Jesus gets it back. So then he says, go. He gives you the authority back. Now, what do you get to do with that authority? You get to choose who you put your faith in. You get to choose who you give the authority to, the devil or God. Every day, you get to choose that. Fear is faith in Satan's promises. That's a choice to fear. Just like it's a choice to believe in faith. So the devil, listen to this, he can actually not do anything in your life because he has no authority to do it. This is the only reason anything happens in your life that the devil says. Because you who do have authority agree with his suggestions. He needs somebody with authority to agree with his suggestions. And just so you know, that's all the devil has is suggestions. He has no power to make something happen in your life. He has no business being in your life. He has no business being in your house. He has no business being with your grandchildren. He has no business being in your family. He has no business being around. Luke 10, 19 makes it very clear. His place is under our so we get under our feet, then why are we talking to him like he's on our level? Why are you afraid of the devil? Jesus has already won the victory you never could have won. Jesus went ahead and fought the fight, knocked him out, and now he gave you the victory belt. You know, it's like going to a boxing match. Paul says that we're more than overcomers. We're more than conquerors. We're more than, con what does that mean? You go to a boxing match and think about it. You go and you, you're, you're watching the ring, first fight, your guy, boom, he gets hit, but he's staying on his feet. And it's going back and forth. Next round, round two, round three, round four, we're cheering. Our guy falls down, but he gets back up. We're like, come on. You know, we get to the end of the fight. Knockout punch in the 15th round. Man, it went the distance. He gets up, his eyes swollen shut, nose is bleeding, it's broken in two places. 
He can't really see anybody. It's like Rocky, you know, Adrian, you know. Can't see nothing. He's looking around. And we're watching in the crowd. We're like, yes, he did it. He's a conqueror. He did it. He's a conqueror. Well, then all of a sudden, you see this lady with beautiful hair, perfectly done. She's walking down the aisle toward the ring. You're like, what's she doing? No, the security ain't stopping her. What's going on? She's walking and she got her perfect makeup, her eyelashes, she's got her heels on, beautiful new dress, fingernails done perfectly, walks into the ring, steps between the ropes. You see, she's his wife. So he gets beat up. She comes and takes the belt out of his hand and takes the check, puts it up in the sky and says, hey. She's more than a conqueror. You see, Jesus went ahead and had the fight. He went ahead and won the victory. And now he just gives you the victory belt and says, you're more. We didn't have to conquer it. Jesus conquered it on the cross. So Moses is in this place where there's a fight going on with these children of Israel estimated around 2.2 million people and they're coming in front of the Red Sea behind them the Egyptians are coming behind them and chasing them they start whining oh no you know what happens the moment so many Christians have a fight the moment it seems to get a little bit hot in the kitchen the moment it seems like there's going to be some pressure because you're trying to believe for your child. You're trying to believe for your body to be healed. You're trying to believe. And guess what? The enemy is an enemy. He's not just going to lay down. So you get a little bit of resistance. Oh, God, I can't. Oh, I can't handle the die. Oh, I should, why did I even become a Christian? I should go back to the world. At least I didn't feel bad about the things I was doing. Jesus. They start whining and the Bible says Moses looks at him and says hey don't give more faith in what Satan's saying right now than what God has already said don't do this and it says he has to walk out by himself because this is so powerful the Bible says he starts praying he gets on his face oh Lord God what you gonna do and God interrupts him says what are you doing why are you crying out to me Moses why are you crying out to me? Get up, move forward in faith. Why did he say that? Why is he upset? He's just trying to pray because he already told Moses what was going to happen. He told him back at the burning bush what was going to happen. He said, I'm going to send you. You're going to get them delivered. They're going to go to the promised land. You're going to lead them. So why are you sitting here crying out to me again? I've told you what's going to happen. You need to get up and move forward in faith. You got to keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward in faith. He says, get your hand up. Get that stick that you've been carrying around. Put it up in the sky. Why? Why couldn't God just part the Red Sea? Why did Moses have to do this? Because God requires you to do your part. He's not going to do it for you. He's not going to make the breakthrough for you. He needs you to do your part. You have a part to play. God has a part to play. Your part is to offer up your stick. Your seemingly nothing. Your five loaves and two fish. If you don't bring the five loaves and two fish, God can't multiply it. You got to give them something to use. So he says, lift up that and the waters parted. This is crazy. Many of you are standing in front of something that is in front of your promise. And this is where it gets sad. Many of us have become content with staying on this side of the Red Sea. You know, I know my body isn't working the way it used to, but, you know, I'm getting older anyway, so I guess it makes sense. I'm, you know, I'm so old, I'm 52 years old. My body's not working the way, I mean, I should expect this. You know, maybe it's God's will, you know. 
I've prayed a few times, had some hands laid on me. It hasn't happened. So God must be like, yeah, you know, it's fine. I'm not going to ever ask him again. You know, he's already done so much for me. You can try to convince yourself of whatever you want to. Just because it's easier to stay on this side of the Jordan, just because it's easier to stay on this side of the Red Sea doesn't mean it was God's promise for you. <laughs> you see, Moses had to deliver them out of Egypt. Why? Because Egypt represents the world. Some of y'all were in the world. And in Egypt, all you can be is a slave. You used to be a slave. Alcohol was whipping you like a taskmaster. <laughs> Drugs, cocaine, whipping you like a taskmaster. <laughs> it was telling you where to go. It was telling you when to get up at night. It was telling you when you were going to crash during the day. It was telling you where you were going to walk to. It was telling you where you had to go. It was telling you where to spend your money. You didn't even have control of your money. The addiction was telling you where your money was going to go. That's called a slave master. But then God sends Moses. Moses is a typology of Jesus. He sends Jesus to deliver you out of the hands of the slave masters. So you get out of Egypt, but then you get to the wilderness. What do you think you are in the wilderness? You're a patient. You're on a gurney in surgery. Why? Because God had to get you out of Egypt, but now God's trying to get Egypt out of you. We call that discipleship. You get saved. You come to a great crusade. You come to an amazing meeting. And so now you're out of the world. Well, the journey's just beginning, brother. Now it's time to take up your cross. Now it's time to get into a DG. Now you got to start getting that world out of you. So many people just think, well, I got saved, so I'm good now. No, 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 no. It's just the beginning, brother. It's just the beginning, sister. You got saved. Now you're really going to go. You see, Jesus died for you on that cross. But the full gospel is this. He died for you on the cross. Then he hands you a cross and says, die for me daily. This is the full gospel. This is what we preach in this church. So you, 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 you come out of Egypt. You're in the wilderness and all your job is, is to lay there in surgery. Let him take out of you what he wants to take out of you. Let him put in you what he wants to put in you. But there's this place called the promised land. Ooh, it's not the wilderness and it's not Egypt. But there's a one type of person that goes into the promised land. Patience can't get in. Slaves can't get in. Only warriors go into the promised land. Only warriors are allowed to cross the Jordan. There's a story in the book of Numbers. You all know the story, Numbers 13. It says that before they went into the land that was promised for them, Moses sent out 12 spies. It says that they all go, and it says 10 come back, and they come back pretty quick. They didn't take a lot of time. <laughs> it's almost like they sent them out that morning. They were back within, you know, a little while. They came back, and their report was this. Yo, <laughs> we ain't going over there. That ain't for us. Listen, you know, it's pretty, yeah. I mean, they do have, like, grapes the size of, like, you know. They got a lot of milk. They got a lot of honey. It would make sense that that's what God promised since he said the land of milk and honey. However, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's probably not for us. You know, I mean, they got these big old giants. You know, I'm not really in for a tussle today. I'm good. You know, my back's just recovering from the last 40 years of walking. <laughs> so they come back and they're like, you know what? Matter of fact. <laughs> and they start convincing everybody else of their commonness, of their settling. And they start convincing everybody else. It starts to get contagious. You know why? Because commonness is contagious. Settling is contagious. Everybody does it. It's everywhere. So they're all there and they're just like, you know what? You know, I actually like this land we're in, you know? It's not too bad. I mean, it's not that green. There's not too many trees around and stuff. But you know, I mean, it's cool. Like, that's a nice hill over there. I could put my house on that hill. You know, I, I could see my kids running around in this, you know, sand for the rest of their life. <clears throat> we got a pond over there. That would, you know, at least help us drink for at least two or three months before it runs out. And then we'd probably die. But it's fine. Like, we got a pond. 
they start saying, you know what? It's just easier if we don't have to go and actually possess what God has said is ours. You see, there is promises that God paid for your family for, for your grandchildren for, for your children for, for your marriage for. Those promises actually already have your name on them, but you actually have to go and take it. It's yours, but are you going to go and take it or are you going to stay on this side of the Jordan River and watch other people sit on your porch, sit in your backyard, sit on your land, take over your babies, take over your grandkids. You're just going to watch your sister suffer? At least she's not like she used to be, but that's not the promise. The promise wouldn't be that she barely survives through life. The promise is that your sister would get on fire for God. The promise is that she'd be in this house. The promise is that she'd be leading a DG. The promise is... But there are two other men who come back. Their name are Joshua and Caleb. They come back, and they come back way later. Why'd they come back so much later? Because, listen, while the other ten spies were looking at the giants... Joshua and Caleb are putting down footprints. Ooh, because he remembered every step I take, God is going to give it to me. They start going through Hebron. Caleb's over there and he starts saying, man, I can't wait to live here. Ooh, what do you think, Joshua? I'll take the left side, the 200 acres over there. You take the right side, the 200 acres over there. Ooh, can you imagine what my windows are going to look like, bro? Oh, wait till you see my crib here, man. It's going to be something. Oh, I can see my kids play. Ooh, my wife is going to love a garden right there. It's going to be beautiful. Ooh, I can't wait till we come to Hebron. I can't. They're putting down footprints while you have already run away because all you could see were the giants, but all they could see was their God. You could look at the giants, I get it, or you could compare the giants to your God. So they come back and they're looking around and they're coming in the camp. They're thinking everybody's packed up, ready to go, but nobody's packed. Matter of fact, everybody's sitting down like they ain't going nowhere. And Joshua and Caleb come into the camp. What's going on? What's happening? Why aren't y'all packed? We just went out and saw the land. You, let's go. Let's go. Let's go get it. Let's go get it. Everybody, what are you talking about? No, 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 no. We're good, man. I like it right here. It's okay. And that's what it's going to be like. I can just tell you now with 90% of the Christians in your life. They're going to be happy. To just go to a once a week service in church. Well, I tithe. I have a good family. My children haven't gotten in trouble for at least three days. I'm super blessed. Super blessed. Way more than I've ever been. I go to the Wayworld Outreach. This is the greatest it gets. And... I don't know about you, but I've made up my mind. I'm going to see everything God promised for me. I'm not going to just sit here on this side and settle for what's here. I'm going to see everything God promised. Do you know that the Wayroad Outreach has not seen everything God promised yet? So if you think even the Wayroad Outreach is going to stay the way it is, you're wrong. There's more campuses. There's more cities. There's way more disciples. They're all over the world. There's a promise, and there are very few people who are willing to get uncomfortable to see what God has always said. You see, there was a plan that God had before you were formed in your mother's womb. It was a purpose. It was a story written for you. And let me tell you, there are many people that will get to heaven that God will show them his book that he had for their life. And they will compare their book that they had for their life, and the two will not match. And in front of the judgment seat, the Bible says you will get to heaven. And he says, everything that doesn't match in your book to his, he burns in the fire. 
The Bible says there will be three types of rewards when we get to heaven. Think about this. It said some people will actually suffer loss. They'll get in, the Bible says, barely escaping the flames. You're getting in by the skin of your teeth, yet you did nothing in this life to get any heavenly treasures. Then there are people, the Bible says, that will have a partial reward. For seasons of their life, you know, they went hard for God. But the cares of this life, all that security and, oh, am I going to be in the safest place? And am I going to know everything that's going on? It kept on stealing. They got into a flow, then they got out. They got into a flow, then they got out. Those are the Christians that are bounce back, bounce in. Bounce back, bounce in. Bounce back. But they've never gone all in for Jesus. They've still always withheld something. And then he says there's going to be people who get the full reward. They're going to get in heaven and Jesus is going to say, well done. Well done. You can't get that unless you are a man or woman of faith. Faith does not settle for this side of the Jordan. You're going to have to change from being a slave. You already aren't a slave anymore. God saved you. But you're going to have to get out of this patient mentality of, ah, I need some. You're going to have to get over that. It's time to become a warrior. It's time to fight for your family like you never have. It's not time to give up. It's not time to stop. It's not time. It's time to believe like you've never believed. You see, there's a fight, and the fight is for your faith. One of the saddest stories in the Bible is in the, found in the book of one, Psalm 137. And it's about the Judean people who were taken out by the Babylonians, pushed out of their land and take over. Listen to these words. This is what happens to the, God's precious people. Beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. We thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps hanging them up on branches and poplar trees. You know what the enemy wants for you? He wants you to stop praising. He wants you to take your harp. He wants you to lose your song because if you stop singing, if you stop praising, if you stop thanking, if you stop worshiping, then maybe he might be able to stop you. But let me tell you something. When you see the giants in front of you, it's not time to start weeping. It's not time to hang your heart. It's time to turn up the volume on your song. It's time to turn up the volume on your praise. It's time to turn up the volume on reminding yourself of the promise. It's time to say those giants, like Caleb said, those are my food. I'm going to eat you alive. You're my next meal. Giants are meals for warriors. You know why? Because for a warrior, a giant represents a promotion. For everybody else, a giant represents intimidation. But for a warrior, a giant represents a promotion. David was promoted because of Goliath. Goliath wasn't his worst thing. The Goliath was the greatest thing that ever happened to David. See, God allows you to fight the battle instead of doing it for you because he wants you to be promoted. He gives you the chance and opportunity to conquer the giant so that you can get promoted. God blesses you with giants so that you can overcome them and be promoted. Oh, man. You see, because when you face a giant you've never seen before, it stretches your faith in a place it's never been before. You see, this same man, Caleb, he had gone in, he comes back. 45 years passed because after they had the conversation with the Israelites, this is amazing, it said they couldn't go in. God would not allow one of those people to go in. A whole generation had to die. And when Caleb was 40 years old is when he said, I want to go to Hebron. I put my footprints around it. But it wasn't until he was 85 years old, according to Joshua chapter 14. He's now 85. All of those people have died and only Joshua and Caleb are the only two who are allowed to go in. 
And the Bible says, think how powerful this is. The Bible says that at 85 years old, Joshua comes to Caleb and says this. Are you ready to go in? And Caleb says, I'm as strong now as I was then. He says, I'm ready for war now to go in and to come out. Just like I was then. And then he says this. Give me this mountain. I walked it 45 years ago, and I'm ready to take the land that my feet have walked across. Give me this mountain. Shout that out loud. Give me this mountain. Come on. Give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. Oh, there's a mountain. Oh, there's a mountain. Here's the question. Are you going to sit at base camp for the rest of your life? Are you going to put on tents down here or are you going to ascend the mountain? I know it's high up there. I know the air is thin up there. I know it's going to be lonely up there because it will be. Not everybody's going to go with you where you want to go in faith. Moses had to separate himself from the crowd and walk out to the Red Sea by himself. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you were the only one who could see it. You were the only one who knew it. You were the only one who kept believing it. But all God needs is one. All God needs is one man's faith. All God needs is one person to believe. The Red Sea will part from one person. The Red Sea will part from one person. He's 85 years old and Caleb says, give me this mountain. Give me the mountain of my grandchildren. They're going to serve God. As long as I'm alive, as long as my grandma is here, as long as my grandpa is here, you're not going to be able to serve the devil, honey, because I have a promise. Give me the mountain of my family. Give me the mountain of my ministry. Give me the mountain. Who wants the mountain? Who's going to stand up and say, give me the mountain? I'm not going to settle for where I've been. I'm not going to settle on this side. I want to see all God promised. There's a mountain for your marriage. There's a mountain. You got to start climbing. You got to say one step of faith. Keep moving in faith. Keep moving in faith. Keep believing in faith. Don't let it discourage you. Don't let people pull you down. The Bible said Caleb was able to go in because he had a different spirit. You see, there were almost three million people. Yet God in the midst of three million people saw every single individual heart. And he saw out of three million people, there were only two hearts that were fully devoted to him. He said of Caleb, he says, he serves me wholeheartedly. You see, men and women who give more faith to their fears than they do to God are not wholehearted followers. To be a wholehearted follower means you believe what God says. And even if it doesn't make sense, you say, because you said it, because you said it, because you said it, because you said it, because you said it. Do you remember when Peter was in the boat? Remember they hadn't caught anything all night? But Jesus comes into the boat. He says, cast out your nets again. He said, Lord, we've been doing this all night. I don't know. You're not even a fisherman. I am, but here's the deal. At your word. Because you said it. I'll do it again. Jesus didn't say cast out your net. Singular. He said cast out your nets. Why? Because God's always going to give you more than you thought he was. He's going to give you more than you know how to ask for. He's going to give you more. He's going to do exceedingly above and beyond. Whatever you can ask or think. But he needs you to give him something to work with. Cast out the net again. Give me the five loaves and the two fish. I know you don't think it's much. But give me something to work with. There's a fight. There's a spiritual battle. It's for your faith. Last two scriptures, I'm going to close. You know, if you really were alone, it would be 
an excuse. But um, the Bible confirms you're actually never alone in faith. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses who have by faith testified of the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, let us strip off every unnecessary weight the sin that so cleverly entangles and let us run with perseverance the race before us looking away from all that distracts us get rid of distractions get rid of distractions and focusing on Jesus oh man you see Jesus is waiting at the mountain he's on top of the mountain saying come on come up higher look at your neighbor and say come up higher Look at your other neighbor. Come up higher. Jesus is on top of the mountain. Come up higher. But you see, you have these witnesses all in heaven. These men and women. When I went to Israel, and here's my closing story. I went to Israel. And years ago, in about, I think it was the year 2011, I was preaching a revival for about 10 months in this church. We'd been going for 10 months straight. Every week, multiple times a week. And this, uh, one of the pastors was there and he said, um, he said, Gavin, I really want to pay for you to go. I said, pay where? He said, Israel, 13 days, you know, fully everything. I said, man, I received that because I hadn't been to the Holy Land yet. So I go over there and during that trip, so many things happened. I had the three most incredible, most, I'd say, impactful experiences that I've ever had as a Christian. All three of them there when I was at the Holy Land. But one of them was specific. We were in a big bus and we had about a team of about 125 people. And we had a tour guide that was in our bus. We all were wearing these earpieces so that wherever we walked, we could be at least 100 yards away from her and we could still hear everything she was saying on the earpieces while we were looking at all these historical sites. We get out of the bus, we all are following and we go into this huge coliseum, this massive coliseum. And it was like, it was like gladiator, I mean it was massive. And I'm like, man, this is, this is cool. Look at the architecture. You know, look how amazing. Like we're all, you know. But then all of a sudden, I promise, this, is, uh, this was crazy. I'm looking around and I start hearing voices. Now, many people be like, oh, that's when you went crazy, Gavin. No, 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 no. But I'm starting to hear, it's like a blurry, like I can't tell the clarity of it, but I'm hearing it all around me. <sighs> what the heck? It's like, and, I, and that's all, it's like a breath. I know there's words, but I can't make out the words yet. So I'm in there and I'm waiting. And I finally asked our tour guide, what is this place? Like, where are we? Something's going on here. He says, well, this is the place where they would put the Christians on a pole. They would burn them alive. And if you look over there, we looked, there were these tiny little like cubicles. He said, those were full of lions and they would release the lions to come and eat the Christians while they were alive. So everybody now is crying in the group. We're all crying. We're all, you know, and then I'm starting to hear it clear, but I can't totally take it out. I'm like, man, I got to get alone. What is going on? So I go up and I sit in the Coliseum by myself. I get away from the whole group. I put my head down, and the moment I start focusing, I say, God, what's going on? And I hear, finish my story, 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 finish my story. I hear it in women's voices. I hear it in men's voices. Finish my story, finish my story, finish my story, finish my story. I'm saying, what the, what, what is going on? God brings me to Hebrews chapter 11. He tells me about the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, and then he says, read the end of Hebrews 11. So I go to the scripture, and I'm going to read it to you. This is what happened. Who by faith, that is, with an enduring trust in his promises, these people subdued kingdoms, administered justice, obtained the promised blessing, closed the mouth of lions, extinguished the power of the raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became mighty and unbeatable in battle, putting enemy forces to flight, people of whom the world was not even worthy. They were wandering in deserts and mountains, living in caves. Look at this, look at this. And all of these, though they gained divine approval through their faith, did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised. Here we go. 
because God had us in mind and had something better for us so that they, these men and women of authentic faith, would not be made perfect. That is, their story would not be completed apart from us. Young woman, young lady, please hear me. Mary, Martha, they're up in heaven and their book isn't done until you write your chapter. The same book they were writing, they're inviting you and saying, come and write your chapter. Young man, Joshua, Moses, Caleb, Paul, they're in heaven and they're saying, you have a chapter in my book. It can't be completed until you finish my story. Nobody will be able to write their chapter in that book except warriors. Slaves do not have a chapter. Patients cannot write a chapter. Warriors are the only ones who get to write a chapter in the book that is in eternity. You see, if you want a safe life, I'm sorry, you won't write a chapter. Because faith means risk. Faith means you're going to have to take a chance and believe something you never believed. Faith means you might have to pioneer something nobody else has done. Faith means it might be lonely. Do you want to be a warrior or do you want to stay on this side of the Jordan and watch the giant sit on your promise? I believe there's warriors all over this building. I believe from the front to the back there are warriors. I believe that this is the time, this is the service, this is the day that before we even get to the end of the year, you don't take another moment to let the potential and the promise of what God has told you ever out of your grasp again. This is the moment we take hold. You're going to take hold right now of your family. You're going to take, take hold of your son. You used to have it for years, but you've given up on him. Don't give up on him. God hasn't given up on him. Don't you give up on him. Don't let yourself be tempted to let it go. Don't settle. Your body's still not working. Are you going to settle? Or are you going to say, my body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I'll have full healing. I will have energy again. I will have power. I don't know what you want, but I'm not going to sit on this side of the Jordan. Every eye is closed. If you could put your hands out like you're going to receive something from God. Every person in your seat, just put your hands out like you're going to receive something from God. There's a war. You cannot have anything in the physical until you first birth it in the spiritual. You cannot see something come to pass in the physical. You see, it's in the place of intimacy with Jesus that you conceive a promise. It's in the place of intimacy that you birth a promise. You see, if it's already birthed in the spiritual, you'll have favor and it will be easy to come out in the physical. But if you're trying to make it happen in the physical only, you will be stressed, you will be overwhelmed, but you got to get with Jesus. We turn our eyes to Jesus. You got to get alone with Jesus. You see, you can't pay Jesus back for what he did for you. You can't pay him enough money. You can't give him enough. What does Jesus want from you? That he actually considers your time. Pay him back with time. You got to get with Jesus in the place of intimacy. He determines when you conceive. He determines when it's birthed. And let me tell you, if it's birthed in the spiritual first, you will not have a hard time pulling it into the physical. Every eye is closed. Every hand is lifted. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You 
Team, come to the front. You deserve the praise. Worthy. Don't stop singing. Come on. And worthy. Altar team's coming to the front. As long as you need to lift it, keep lifting it up. Worthy is. Let that faith get stirred again. When you put your eyes back on Jesus, you see the size of your God, not the size of your giants. Come on, let's worship Him. And worthy Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is. He's what matters. He's what matters. In the place of intimacy. If you do not know Jesus, no person is moving right now. I want you to be bold enough to say, I want to know this Jesus right now in the midst of this beautiful anointing and the presence of God that is here. I want you to be bold enough. This would make Jesus happier than anything. If you would say, I'm coming down to the front, I want to receive Jesus. Get out of your chair right now. I'm looking for you right now. Come on, this is your moment. I want to know Jesus. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know if I'm going to heaven when I die. Get peace with God right now. Come on up. We got them coming from all over. Come on up. Come on up. You need peace with God. Come on up. He's so good. He wants you. He loves you. Come on up. Look at this. Come on, we got people coming all the way from the back. Give them a hand. This is making Jesus so happy right now. There's nothing that makes him more happy. He'd leave the 99 for the one. He's been thinking about you all week. He's been thinking about you when you came. He's been thinking about you all night. Cause worthy is your name. Lift it up one more time. Worthy is Yes, he does. 
so beautiful, God. Worthy is your Come on up. We got room for you. 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 Come on. There's room at the table of Jesus. There's room in the house of God. Come on. Welcome to the family today. Come on. Come on. Get, get, come a part of the family. Now we're going to pray a prayer all out loud with all of these beautiful new people that are coming right now. Now after we say this prayer, do not move because we're going to have one more prayer of blessing. Let's say this prayer out loud. Would you help us as a big family? If you already know Jesus, make sure you're saying this. If you don't know Jesus, make sure you say this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for the blood. Wash me clean of all of my failures. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord take over God I want you to be the boss make me a disciple help me to forgive myself as they're praying with you right now you are now a child of God they're gonna pray for you right now your name is now being written in the book of heaven now all the altar workers begin to go to work begin to pray they're gonna be helping you every other person out there put your hands in the air the altar workers will take it from here. I'm going to pray over you right now a blessing. I pray in the name of Jesus. Come on, get with me in faith. Come on, stretch out your faith. Don't just stretch out your hands. Stretch out your faith. I believe in the name of Jesus. Come on, I'm just praying over you. Thank you for repeating, but just stretch out your faith. I believe in the name of Jesus that every single one of you right now are receiving the desire to have your true purpose fulfilled I believe that you will never settle again I believe in Jesus name that your faith is being blown on like a flame and it's getting bigger and bigger I thank you God that because they are going to obey your voice I thank you God that because they're listening to you their houses will be blessed their children will be blessed their grandchildren will be blessed I thank you because they're going to forsake the commonness of being a Christian and now become a real disciple of Jesus Christ. I thank you we go all in that their families blessed, that their businesses are blessed. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke the devourer over our finances. We rebuke the devourer over our children. Come on, pray. We rebuke the devourer over our grandchildren. You have no place in our lives. I'm thanking you, God, that homes right now that are full of all kinds of hostility, arguing in the home, we clear out the drama, we clear out the chaos. I thank you for peace in your house. I thank you that the angels of God are in the rooms of your children. I thank you that when you pray, God answers. I thank you that when you sleep, your dreams are sweet. Lord God, I'm praying right now that every person, as we agree with this in faith, the Lord's face shine upon you. May his blessing be on you and give you peace. Everybody shouted, amen. Give God a hand. Give God a hand. Come on, worthy is your name. Come on.